The growing trend in sports nutrition is that every athlete's body is unique. At the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, we are working to help athletes and their influencers better understand these differences so they can better fuel their bodies. GSSI has a variety of tools to accomplish this, from testing the unique attributes of each athlete to nutrition personalization programs and educational outreach, GSSI is striving to make sure athletes and their influencers are more informed about their nutritional needs than ever before. GSSI is also an educational resource for sports health professionals, athletic trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, registered dietitians and sports scientists all turn to GSSI to gain insights into the latest research and strategies that they can put to use with their own athletes. Whether it's in the lab or on the field, online or offline, GSSI is giving athletes and their influences an invaluable look at how nutrition and hydration can change their game, help them reach their goals and become the best they can be. Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth GSSI Food School. Um, good afternoon or good morning wherever you're joining us from. Um, thanks to everyone who is joining us today. Um, if you've attended previous webinars, then you probably know who I am by now. But for any new attendees, um, I'm Dr. Rebecca Randall. Um, I've been working with the Gatorade Sports Science Institute for eight years and I'm currently a senior scientist. As with the previous sessions, I'm going to be moderating and asking the speakers any questions. So we'd love to hear from you. And um, if you've got any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll try and get through as many questions as we can after each um, speaker has spoken. And um, to give you some background about GSSI, our long-standing mission is to help athletes optimize their health and performance through research and education in hydration and nutrition science. And we work primarily under four main pillars, and these are education, research, innovation, and athlete service. Uh, these webinars are related to our education pillar with the aim to educate more sports science or sports professionals than ever. And as we obviously cannot meet in person due to these challenging times, this virtual platform is a great way for us to provide sports nutrition presentations. Today, as you would have seen, our talks will be focusing on nutrition and hydration for football. And our speakers are Dr. Julia Bone and Dr. Robert Norton. Uh, the format will be the same as previous webinars. Each speaker will have 20 minutes. And as I said, we should have some time after both speakers have presented for some questions and answers. So let's begin with our first speaker, who is Dr. Julia Bone. Uh, Julia is a registered dietitian, an SENR practitioner and advanced sports dietitian. Julia completed her PhD at the Australian Institute of Sports before moving to Northern Ireland, where she currently works as a performance nutritionist with Sport Northern Ireland Sports Institute. Julia has worked with senior and developing athletes across a number of different sports and Julia is going to talk to us today on nutrition for football. So I'll pass it over to you, Julia. Thank you very much, uh, Becca, for the introduction and good morning or afternoon, everyone um, as well. So this presentation is going to cover briefly the basics of football physiology um, and then subsequently the energy and macronutrient requirements um, and reported nutrition practice of football players and recommendations for match day nutrition. Uh, so it's important to understand the physiological and metabolic demands of football as this will dictate the nutrition strategies and interventions to support performance. For outfield players, a typical match consists of periods of high intensity running intermixed with periods of low intensity running, walking or rest. Energy production is predominantly aerobic, however anaerobic energy production also plays an important role with decreases in muscle glycogen linked with increases in fatigue and decreases in performance. 
thus making muscle glycogen the key substrate and carbohydrates a key nutrient for energy production during matches. Uh, this is reflected during matches. Um, also, just uh, so this is reflected in the differences in training load on match days compared to training days, um, as can be seen here uh, from the study by Andersons and colleagues. With greater total distance, max speed, and sprint distance covered in matches compared to trainings in English Premier League players. So this study had a small sample size of six. However, similar results, go on to the next slide, uh, were also observed in about 36 to 39 senior men competing in the top Dutch league uh, with higher total distance and max speed and matches compared to trainings independent of playing position. So in these studies, energy expenditure was assessed by doubly labelled water. So it doesn't provide a breakdown or comparison of the day-to-day -day expenditure, but an average of either the seven or 14 day study period. Uh, total daily energy expenditure was reported to be around 3,300 um, and 3,500 kilocal per day in both studies. Absolute energy expenditure doesn't appear to vary across positions, but when reported relative to body mass or lean mass, goalkeepers tend to have a lower expenditure um, due to their bigger size, and midfielders had the highest energy expenditure. In adolescent academy players, total energy expenditure has also been measured by either doubly labelled water or accelerometry across the different age groups. Um, energy expenditure increases with age, which is not surprising as players develop and mature, resulting in bigger size and lean mass. Um, Hannon and colleagues reported average energy expenditure over two seven-day periods, with differences week to week in the under-12s and under-13s, but not in the under-15s and under-18s. Energy expenditure of the under-18s was found to be comparable to the senior players. Uh, there's limited information regarding energy expenditure in female footballers um, and values are often predicted and not measured by double labelled water or accelerometry. Uh, looking at these figures, it would appear that on average senior women expend less energy than their junior counterparts, but as all these values has, have been estimated, estimated using, um, it's difficult to make comparisons between the different age groups. But it would appear uh, that energy expenditure ranges from around 2,100 to 2,600 in female footballers. As far as I'm aware, there's been one study which was published just this year in professional female players that compared energy intake and energy expenditure across an in-season week. Um, they didn't report total energy expenditure, but the energy expenditure during exercise across the different training days. As expected, exercise energy expenditure uh, varied with light training days and rest days being lower than the heavy training or match days. What's interesting from the study is that we can see that the average self-reported energy intake does not vary across the different days, even though exercise energy expenditure does. In the study, only one player was identified as being an under-reporter, so the results indicate that there was under-fueling in these female players. Um, and this is reflected in the low energy availability on the match and heavy training days. For the other studies in female athletes, um, energy is in intake is averaged across the study period. So there's no differentiation between training or match days. Um, in the other study in senior women, um, it was reported to be an average intake of around 1900 kilocalories per day. While in junior female um, elite players, there's a wide range of energy intakes, with uh, intakes on average being around 2,017 Canadian junior athletes and 2,260 in the German athletes. Um, and this large variation in the junior players could be due to the variation in the ages um, from 13 to 17 and also potentially underreporting as well. Similar to the female athletes, there's average daily intakes rather than comparisons to training and non-training days or match days in male academy players. Self-reported energy intakes in this group have been reported to be on average around 1,900 kilocalories per day across the three age groups um, in one study and approximately 2,600 um, in the under-12s, under-13s, 2,800 
kilocal in the under 15s and 3,000 kilocal per day in the under 18s. Uh, with differences in values between the studies likely due to differences in the recording of dietary information and nutrition analysis. Um, can I have the next slide please? Um, in the senior men, recorded energy intakes uh, mirror the training load data, with mean total energy intake being significantly higher on a match day compared to a rest um, or training day in players playing in the Dutch League and the English League. Um, on the graph there from Anderson's study, the energy intake is around 3,800 on a match day compared to around 2,900 um, on a training day. While in the study or the players in the Dutch League, the absolute values were lower, but the gap between the match and the non-match days was approximately the same at around 500 to 600 kilocalories. Again, differences between study likely due to reporting um, and different nutritional software. All these studies um, across the different age groups and the different sexes emphasize that there were large individual variations in energy expenditure and intake across the players, um, even when playing in similar positions. So a lot of these values can be used as a starting point to guide us as practitioners on how much energy or calories your player may need to, to eat. Um, it's important that the requirements need to be individualized and adjusted for match day and training um, and rest days accordingly. Um, as mentioned earlier, glycogen and carbohydrates are key nutrients and substrates for fueling football. Uh, so carbohydrates are not only the primary fuel source for muscle during intermittent exercise, but they are also the primary fuel source for the brain. So as a sport that also includes skill, tactics and decision making, adequate carbohydrate intake is important for optimal cognitive function, as well as maximizing physiological performance and minimizing fatigue. The carbohydrate recommendations have shifted away from a higher carbohydrate intake every day uh, to a more periodized approach, um, changing it relative to training or match demands. Some training days will be a lower intensity or a tactical session and a lower carbohydrate intake would be appropriate in these instances. While on a match day, a minimum of around six grams per kilogram of carbohydrates is advised. Um, exceptions to this might be in the pre-season where training duration and intensity is likely to be higher um, or when there's a high number of games are played over a short period of time and there might be insufficient time for complete muscle glycogen resynthesis between matches. So for instance, within two games within 48 hours or in tournaments where there's a game a day. In senior male athletes, the difference in energy intake in the English Premier League players appears to come mainly from changes in carbohydrate intake throughout the course of the week. Uh, with match day carbohydrate around six grams per kilogram compared to four grams per kilogram on training days. Um, so this may appear as though the players are meeting their requirements, but for that study, this was a week where two games were played. So it's likely that they didn't optimize muscle glycogen storage in the lead up and recovery from those games. And players competing in the Dutch league, training day carbohydrate intake was similar to those observed in the Premier League players, but match day intake did not meet recommended guidelines. Um, and it's important to note that this is data that's collected during competition um, and pre-season intakes um, are yet to be established. There isn't a comparison of training to match day carbohydrate intake in female junior players. Um, in female players, regardless of their age, average carbohydrate intake is reported as being less than six grams per kilogram, indicating that there's inadequate fueling for matches and or heavy training days. And this is supported by the data from the MOS study published this year, where carbohydrate intake was the same on a match day compared to a rest day. And I suppose what's more concerning here is the proportion of athletes consuming a low carbohydrate intake on a match and heavy training day with five out of the 13 uh, players having less than three grams per kilogram, um, which is half of the recommended amount for a match day. In academy players, carbohydrate intake uh, relative to body mass decreases as age increases, again, potentially leading to some underfueling and under 18s for, on matches. Uh, one study by Briggs did compare carbohydrate intake across a competition and training week uh, with no difference observed between matches and training days in the under 15, under 16 age group. 
Uh, protein requirements for footballers are similar for other sports, ranging from 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram of body mass per day. Higher intakes might be required if an athlete is trying to maintain um, muscle mass following a calorie deficit. To maximize muscle protein synthesis, it's recommended to distribute the protein intake evenly throughout the day at about 0.3 grams per kilogram or around 20 gram serves every three hours. Um, and although there's some evidence that after whole body or gym resistance training, um, a higher dose of 0.4 grams per kilogram um, should be consumed. Meanwhile, there's recent work into pre-sleep protein um, indicating 40 grams of protein consumed within 30 to 60 minutes of going to bed um, is effective in stimulating muscle protein synthesis overnight. In senior men, protein intakes are consistent across the day of the week, regardless if it's a training or match day, um, with intakes ranging from 1.5 to 2.5 grams per kg, depending on the study. Uh, while the graph um, there shows that regardless of the type of day, whether it's training or match or rest, protein intake tends to be skewed with the highest intakes always at dinner, um, with snacks and breakfast often not meeting the 20 grams or 0.3 gram per kilo recommendation. Protein intakes appear to be on the higher end in academy players with studies reporting intakes from 1.6 to 2.2 um, and 2.1 to 2.5 grams per kilogram across the various age groups in the different studies. Uh, there's minimal differences in relative protein intake across the different age groups um, and similar to the senior players, protein intake is lowest at breakfast and highest at dinner. Uh, in female players, protein intake appears to be also adequate, um, with professional players consuming more than the junior elite. Um, I wasn't able to find any within day distribution data, uh, but from experience with female athletes in other sports, there would likely be the same pattern of low protein at breakfast and highest at dinner, similar to their male counterparts. There are no football-specific recommendations for dietary fat intake, uh, with research advising that should be in line with public health guidelines. Overall, average fat intake is similar across the age groups and sexes um, and with consistent intakes across the competition week. And higher fat intakes may be required if an athlete is in a period of high energy expenditure or growth. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on macronutrients, um, but there are some that have been highlighted as of interest to all athletes, not just footballers. Um, you want to encourage athletes to eat a varied diet in order to achieve appropriate intake of vitamins and minerals, but there are some populations or dietary patterns that can put some players at an increased risk of a deficiency. So iron deficiency, which can compromise performance due to impaired muscle function and lower work capacity. Uh, so athletes with lower energy intakes, female athletes with the regular menstrual cycle and vegetarian and vegan athletes um, are at higher risk um, of having low iron stores. The sunshine vitamin, vitamin D, which is important for bone health and immune function. Um, for pe so people who live furthest from the equator are at increased risk of deficiency in the autumn and winter, as well as athletes who may train and play outdoors with long sleeves um, and leggings covering their arms and legs throughout the year. Calcium, which is important for muscle contraction, growth and bone health, especially in those adolescent um, academy players. Low intakes are associated with restricted energy intake, disordered eating or avoidance of dairy products and other calcium rich foods, which could result in inadequate intakes. And finally, vitamin B12, which is important for DNA synthesis and the development of mature red blood cells. Dietary sources are animal based, so it would be, need to be supplemented if the player is following a vegan or heavy plant based diet. Moving on to fueling the performance, um, it's not just about game day. We need to consider what the player eats the day before the match. Um, a higher carbohydrate intake has been um, advised in the literature in the range of 7 to 12 or 6 to 10 grams per kilogram to, maxify, to maximize glycogen stores, especially if it's a two-game week. With the goals of match day nutrition to minimize any gut discomfort um, and ensure that players are starting the match with a full fuel tank. Similar to other team sports, pre-match meal should be high in carbohydrate, aiming for around 2 grams per kilogram body mass, so within that 1 to 4, that's often recommended for all sports. It should contain some protein and be low in foods that are too high in fat and fibre 
as this will likely slow digestion and may leave athletes feeling full but not well fueled. So typically pasta or rice based dishes using tomato based sauces or alternatives such as evaporated milk instead of cream and sauces to reduce the fat content. Um, if you have athletes that find eating within three hours is too close or they get nervous or have trouble with stomach discomfort, then liquid meals such as smoothies and soups are good options provided they're still getting a similar amount of carbohydrates. Uh, top off is often recommended whether it's gels, jellies, sports drinks or fruit and this would also be just before warm up or before the players enter the tunnel depending on preference, um, logistics and availability. It's recommended during the match that players consume 30 to 60 grams per hour or at minimum 60 grams for the whole match. Sports drinks might be preferred as you're getting both carbs and fluids, but other options include simple to consume and digest carbs such as gels or gummies. During the match, typically there's only a small window to get fuel on boards, mainly at half time, so you need to take this into consideration and think about how to encourage fuel intake, whether it's having bottles lined up by the door in the changing room um, so they can just grab them as they walk in or having gels with tops already open so that they just have to squeeze them into their mouth. After the match you want to incorporate the four R's, repair, refuel, rehydrate and revitalize for nutrition recovery. They're pretty self-explanatory, so rehydrate with fluids, refuel the tank um, with carbs, repair muscle damage with protein and revitalize means to incorporate vitamins and minerals um, and antioxidants through fruit and veg or maybe some targeted supplements. The strategy or how aggressive you are in terms of nutrition recovery depends on your schedule. If there's a week between games and a couple of days until the next training session, then you can probably be more relaxed, um, especially if it's a night game as you might want to prioritise sleep. If however there's another match within two days, you probably need to be more aggressive to ensure that they've restored enough muscle glycogen for the next game. Uh, carbohydrate intake will likely also need to be high on the rest days or the training day after the match, otherwise they risk starting the next match under field. So what are players doing at the moment? Um, we only have the match day breakdown for senior males and the EPL. Um, so with the dark bars is an 8pm kickoff, the white bars are 4pm, which is two days later. And if we look at the pre-match meal, they're not meeting that 2 gram per kilogram recommendation. During the game, the average was just under 50 grams of carbs intake, with only two of the six players reaching 30 grams per hour. Um, and in the post-match recovery meal, the kickoff time does play a role. Carb intake was a lot higher in meeting recommendations following the 4 p.m. kickoff, um, but not the 8 p.m. kickoff there, where both the post-match snack and the meal were less than 1.2 grams per kg. Quickly on supplements, uh, we promote a food first, but not necessarily a food only process. Uh, sometimes supplements will need to be used to correct a diagnosed nutrition deficiency. Sports foods are often commonly used in times of convenience to aid rapid refueling or recovery um, while traveling, while ergogenic aids targeting performance. Um, there's strong evidence supporting caffeine and creatine use in team sports. And there are two excellent open access reviews with the references there on screen, um, which I direct you to for more detail on ergogenic supplements and, team, uh, and sport performance. So overall, be mindful that energy and carbohydrate requirements vary across the week um, and should match training and match demands. Most players are meeting their fat and protein requirements, but carb intake is often low. So as practitioners, we need to think about how we can encourage them and get them to buy into meeting their carbohydrate needs. And protein intake is often good, but the sprudel distribution throughout the day may need to be improved. Match day nutrition often begins the day before or even two days if the match has already been played that week. Um, encourage fueling during the match where possible and think about how to make it easier for the players to fuel and remembering the four hours of recovery and how aggressive you are with your recovery strategies will be dictated often by your competition schedule. So thank you everyone. Thanks so much, Heli. I was really engrossed, so <laughs> I wanted you to keep going. Um, but thanks so much, a really clear presentation and have given some great recommendations for practitioners that might be attending. Um, we have had some questions come through. If you're still thinking of some, then please just keep sending them. Um, we'll be answering or be asking the questions at the end of both speakers. So um, thanks again, Julia. We'll move on to um, Rob's presentation. So just to give Robert an introduction, here's a 
a senior lecturer in sport, exercise and nutrition sciences at the University of Huddersfield and also works as a performance nutritionist within elite football. And Rob completed his PhD with Liverpool Football Club, investigating the eating habits of elite youth football players whilst working as the academy nutritionist. Um, Rob currently works as the performance nutritionist at Glasgow Celtic Football Club, a role he's held since 2016. Um, today, Rob's going to focus on hydration and hydration for football. So you can take it away, Rob. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Becca. Good morning or good evening, depending where you are. Um, thank you, Julia, for that introduction to football. And I'll move on to my slides now on hydration. Okay, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so I think hydration is generally an area that most players and coaches have a good idea that's important, but we often don't see them sticking maybe to the scientific recommendations um, that are given. And as Julia mentioned, football is an intermittent sport, periods of high intensity and low intensity. But what's particular about football is the competition and the amount of competition that these players play. We think of the recent restart, the Premier League, some teams are playing the game every three or four days. Could I have the next slide, please? So first of all, what is dehydration? Uh, dehydration is defined, defined sorry, as a reaction involving the loss of a water molecule or loss of body water. And an athlete is often considered dehydrated when we see acute losses of body mass of over 2%. So if you've done a bout of exercise and you've weighed yourself pre and post, you see that uh, that, that mass is decreased. That's not going to be for a loss of fat mass or muscle mass, but it's actually just going to be losses in water. Can you have the next slide, please? So in terms of fluid loss in sweat, sweat's vitally important as part of our thermal regulation and sweat, sweating is one of the most effective ways in which we lose body heat. That's important to maintain homeostasis within the body. There's a huge individual variance when it comes to sweating. You might know, know it yourself when you're playing football or any other sports with someone, you might have someone that's particularly sweaty, and then you might have someone who looks like they've not even broken a sweat. So it can vary depending on the person. Now there is some data in other sports, such as marathon runners, that shows that there's a correlation between the amount that one uh, person might sweat compared to their completion time. So we see better completion times with those who sweat a little bit more. As I said, it's hugely individual. If we think of football, it might depend on their position, what they're meant to do. So we're probably going to see a higher sweating uh, from a fullback who's maybe up and down the wing compared to maybe the goalkeeper who stops in the box and doesn't do too much. Can I have the next slide, please? So here we just have a little look at the sweat loss at different temperatures. Okay, so this exercise was performed uh, for 60 minutes, around 60 to 70 percent of VO2 max. Football averages out um, around 70 percent VO2 max, but as mentioned before, it's intermittent, so we have periods of really high intensity and you know, periods of lower intensity. Now, we consider that many football tournaments, such as uh, the World Cup, uh, the Euros, other different continents um, competitions, take place in the summer. We're probably looking at higher temperatures around the 30 to 35. And we can see that we look at the average sweat loss around there, we're approaching up to three litres, which is a huge amount. And I just want you to bear, in, bear that in mind for some of the recommendations that we're going to have coming up soon. Can we move to the next slide, please? So some of the reported effects that uh, go alongside dehydration uh, is mainly affecting our aerobic capacity. However, this is often dependent on the severity of the dehydration. We also need to note that when we compete in warm environments, we can have someone who is euhydrated, so that means they're fully hydrated. They can still see performance decrements. So it's not necessarily just down to uh, dehydration, it might be as a result of the heat. So with some of these, it might help with different cooling techniques. So again, when you see warm, te uh, warm temperature tournaments, it might be a wet towel, it might be taking an ice beverage, things like that. And the aim is not necessarily to rehydrate just, but to help to cool the body down. 
Now, this is where we get a little bit of in, a, a, a paradox really with, with hydration because Halbert Algarsi completed uh, a marathon in Berlin a couple of years ago, set the world record, and he actually seen a 10% uh, de decrease in his body mass. So quite dehydrated, that's quite a severe de dehydration. And whilst I'm not recommending that at all, there's also with some sports, hydration is perhaps overstated a little bit more than it needs to be. And there's not a huge amount of evidence in football, so we're just going to have a little look at what we can take from that. So go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, most athletes and coaches are aware that reduction in the body's water content, so dehydration impairs performance. For anyone who's ever taken part in any sport on a hot day, they probably heard their colleagues, uh, their coaches make encouraging them to take water on. Over mild dehydration, one, two percent might go unnoticed. And it's we've got to think as well how the sport goes. Who we mentioned before, but in football, fuel opportunities are few and far between. We only really have half time. So it might be that we need to adapt and get the players ready to to compete in these in these circumstances. And there is a risk of hyponatremia, a small risk, uh, but there is a risk of that. I'm going to explain what that is on the next slide, please. Okay, so hyponatremia is a condition that occurs when we, the level of sodium within the blood is abnormally low. We generally uh, will get hyponatremia for just taking on huge amounts of water. So it's not a condition that we believe comes from excessive losses of sodium uh, during sweating, but from taking on too much water. Now, typically this is rare, as I mentioned, and it has, but it has been reported in some endurance events, such as marathon, uh, marathon running and Ironman. Excess intake of water, if we have hyponatremia that is maintained, it can in extreme circumstances result in death. And we've actually seen that in some competitions where it's been like trying to drink, people trying to drink the most water that they can. And what happens is when we have a low sodium in the blood, we have higher sodium concentrations in the cells. And what we see then is that the, the cells begin to swell by taking in excess water and disrupt and uh, can also become extremely damaged. Can we go to the next slide, please? So just quickly on the role of sodium, we're going to touch on this again later on with some recommendations. It's one of the major electrolytes in the body. As I mentioned, we have a higher concentration of the extracellular fluid than intracellular fluid. Involved in muscle contractions through the sodium potassium pump. We can lose around one to two grams per litre or more in sweat. So you might have heard this term before, are you a salty sweater? Uh, and Gatorade and GSSI are now looking at some different sort of sweat rates of individuals. Sports drink can contain around 10 to 25 millimoles per litre, which probably isn't adequate to replace that sodium that we're losing. So we're going to look at some strategies that we can work on that. Go to the next slide, please. So some of the benefits of adding sodium, it can increase the probability of the drink or the food. It helps maintain first and that can help promote the athlete uh, to drink. To some extent can help prevent hyponatremia, increase the rate of water absorption, increase retention of fluid, which is important for the rehydration, as who we mentioned earlier, and make some contribution to the offsetting of sodium losses in sweat. So we've spoken about what dehydration is, why it potentially could be an issue, but how do we know if we are becoming dehydrated? So we go to the next slide, please. So how do we try and measure this? So there are a couple of measures. I'm going to concentrate on two ones that are pretty easy to do, and everyone who's listening to this can do this themselves, and then one that might be a bit, little bit more scientific. So go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, simply weighing body mass. So acute body mass and um, changes reflects height someone's hydration status. So what you could do is have the high, uh, athlete weigh themselves pre-exercise and post-exercise. Now this might not always be convenient. Um, before a match, you know, players are going for their routine, the coach is trying to speak to them. Me as a nutritionist going around with a pair of scales, asking someone to jump on is, is probably not feasible. But you might have an idea of what, what that player is. They could do it previously before they arrive at the ground, they could do it at the hotel. Post-exercise, again, a little bit difficult if it's been a, 
a loss to a last minute penalty. Trying to implement nutrition techniques can be difficult as it is, never mind going around with scales. So it might be something you do back at the hotel um, or when the player gets home. But it's easy, it's cheap, it's an indirect method. I'm going to explain how we use that data a little later on. And go to the next slide, please. Simply having a look at the urine colour um, when you go to the toilet. It can be a little bit of individual vari variation from my experience of dealing with this. It's a very rough indi indication of hydration status and typically the, the darker the urine, okay, the more likely that person is uh, dehydrated. Obviously there's, there's no cost with it, it can be done by the athlete themselves, but probably something that you want to work with someone on to try and get a to get an idea. So for example, if someone takes a vitamin C tablet and then goes to the toilet, often their, their urine colour can be affected by that. So it's just something to bear in mind that the dietary habits of the individual might affect it as well. We'll go to the next slide, please. And urine specific gravity. I feel like doing this test is a bit of a rite of passage uh, for any sports nutritionist or um, any sports scientist. I remember being an intern at football clubs and to do this quite often. Um, so what you do is get a urine sample um, from a from the athlete. Um, you drop it, as we just see here on the photometer, that will give you a score. So if we've got over 1.025, that's indicating dehydration. However, there are individual variations with this. I have had dealt with certain players that the score is kind of always around that dehydration mark, no matter how much water they seem to drink. I mentioned earlier, we don't want people drinking excessive amounts of water for no reason. If players know they're getting tested as well, often that morning they make a specific effort to drink more water, so it might actually not be a reflection of their habits. So I don't know how valuable this always is, um, and also you've got to think of the time that it might take to do this test. It might be better just to use the other two methods and try and educate your athletes. Can we move to the next slide, please? So just look at some of the recommendations around hydration. Um, and they're going to be quite varied, as you see here from our typical textbooks. Um, if you just go to the next slide, please. So if you just look at some of the recommendations here, now granted these are based over a, a long period of time here, over 30 years, but we can see quite a difference. Um, and trying to think how we could implement some of these is quite difficult to do. So just if it's just to pick out a, a couple here, um, abundance amount before, during and after, um, from Pollock and Wilmo, think how that might affect the stomach. Dr start drinking long before you feel thirsty, it's kind of hard to estimate when you're going to feel thirsty. Uh, according to weight changes, how we're going to do that within competition is quite difficult. And we look at one of the most um, a couple of the most recent ones, drinking to match sweat rate. Now you had the test, so you knew what your sweat rate was previously. You can maybe look to do that. But as we mentioned before, our opportunities to take on um, nutritional products and, and water during the football match are, are, are few and far between. And trying to take on 150 to 300 mil every 10 to 15 minutes. I mean, just think of that yourself. If you were trying to take on that body of water, as your exercise, it's going to be pretty difficult to do. But before it was shown sweat rates of up to three liters in 60 minutes. Now imagine trying to replace that for kind of three liters of water as you play a football game. That's going to be pretty difficult and might lead to some stomach issues. Let me go to the next slide, please. As Julia pointed out before, we're looking when it comes to preparing for a match day, we've got the pre-match, during and post. And what's most important here is carbohydrates. They have a key fuel here. Um, and it actually might be that we use hydration to drinks uh, as a method to get more carbohydrates into, into the body. So can we go to the next slide, please? So coming into the match day, place should be focused on nutrition in the previous 24 hours. This is typically where we look for that carbohydrate load. So when we're looking at that carbohydrate load, it's important also to take hydration on to help store those carbohydrates as muscle glycogen. So for every gram that we look to store within the muscle and the liver, we're looking for approximately three milliliters of water. So probably important to know that a lot of the foods that the players will be having will have a, a water content as well, such as if we think of pasta, we think of rice. But what they say here is if we can get 
If you encourage your players to have a drink with every meal. It might be an easy way to incorporate some carbohydrates. So having a sports drink on the day before and during training. It might be having smoothies uh, throughout the day and just try and increase the amount that they have. We're aiming when we're coming up to kick off around six milliliters per kilo of body mass. Okay, of water. But again, I just encourage them to have what they have with the meal. If you're working as a nutritionist with a team, it might be a good idea to be there pre-match for some of the games to try and get an idea of what their habits are. As we mentioned before, we've self-recorded um, uh, nutrition intakes. Often we, we don't get the full picture. Also, when we talk about the day before, I've had players before that if it's an earlier kickoff, so say a 12 o'clock kickoff, they'll try and drink a lot of water and take a lot of uh, fluids on the night before. Then they find themselves getting up a lot, a lot of the time during the night to go to the toilet which is obviously disrupting the sleep, are they then coming in as well rested to the game as they could be? So it's just little things to consider there. Go to the next slide, please. So during, during the game, this, this can be quite difficult. Um, there's sometimes drinks breaks. So with the restart for the Premier League, there was drinks breaks uh, around 22 and a half minutes. So about halfway through the first half and same for the second half. Uh, the weather here wasn't great, so we don't know how necessarily much it was needed. And it was often really used as a tactical tactical break. But again, what I'd say here is probably actually to get carbohydrates on, not necessarily looking at hydration, it'd just be that like beef through fluids. That was the mode of, of how we got carbohydrate on. But there's a lot of gels that are available as well that provide a certain amount of hydration. What you could do is have bottles placed around the pitch uh, in the goal with the goalkeeper. When the physio goes on, you often see them bringing on some drinks and they're normally labelled which one have carbohydrates in, which ones might be just electrolyte based. At half time, obviously there's an opportunity there, but we have to consider how much they're taking on. So we don't want players necessarily having a full bottle of a sports drink, which is 500 millilitres, as that sitting in the stomach might just be a little bit uncomfortable and give them a stitch when they go back out. As I said, as I say, the priority is carbohydrates. Just trying to get some carbohydrates on, some electrolytes. Probably the one of the worst things they can take at half time is just having water. With the electrolytes, what you could do is try and condense them a little bit more. So if you have electrolyte tablets, you just put it in a smaller body of water so they don't have to take on quite as much. Can move to the next slide, please. And, and just one thing I want to stress here for any in game strategies. Hydration, carbohydrates, hygienic aids, it's vitally important to practice these during training. First time someone tries a certain nutritional strategy, it should not be in the game because it could lead to a decrease in performance, the player feeling ill, and as a nutritionist, then you lose a little bit of trust with the player and potentially the coach as well. And move on to the next slide, please. And just to, to touch on post match, um, Rehydration being one of the key hours, but a, long, a lot of time will go along the, the other ones as well. So repair, refuel, revitalize. So if we're looking for some protein and carbohydrates and hydration, a recovery drink is a great way to get this in. From personal experience, I find some players will prefer to have a shake. At first, they'll, they'll struggle to get food down. We're looking to, to rehydrate, so we want elements of sodium in there to help them retain that water. So what this could be is not necessarily adding further sodium to the drink, but the food that is available. It could be have some salty snacks uh, or a little bit of salt on, on the foods that can often help with this idea of um, the palpability of the food, but also to stimulate first. Next slide, please. I think that's my final slide. So it's going just to the key points. Dehydration can negatively affect performance. But it's often when it's quite severe. So small amounts of dehydration don't appear to have a huge effect, but it's something that might have an individual variation. It may be beneficial to monitor hydration status through weigh-ins and urine assessment. I think this would probably be a good idea during tournament play or when there are a number of games in close proximity to just check that there's not an accumulation effect of dehydration. So what I mean by that is if someone comes dehydrated just a little bit each day, eventually that's going to add up to potentially high, high losses in, in body mass. Pre-match, we look for six to eight mils per kilogram um, of body mass about two or three hours before, and then just topping up, sipping uh, maybe on a sports drink or a carbohydrate gel beforehand. 
During the match, but for breaks in play and half time, important to have alongside carbohydrates and electrolytes. Carbohydrates is the key. And be sure to practice any techniques that you recommend to your athletes. Post match, in terms of hydration, we're looking for approximately 1.5 litres per kilogram that is lost with the addition of sodium. I believe that's, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much. Um, I think two talks that have really complemented each other, so thank you. And Rob, I think you gave some great recommendations for um, getting that hydration on board, especially in somewhere like the Philippines where they're often exercising or training or competing in really hot conditions. So obviously their sweat rates are going to be higher. So definitely some hydration recommendations that people can, can take home today. Um, we have had some questions in, so um, I'll, I'll go through them. The first one um, is for both of you. And one thing that we haven't really discussed in either presentation is when t uh, games go into extra time, which we do see is quite common, especially in a tournament setting. Um, so maybe if I go to you first, Rob, um, what do you think are the hydration considerations when games do go into extra time? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, my colleague Liam Harper does a lot of research every time, so I'd be annoyed that I didn't bring it up. Uh, what we do, what I've done with, work with players, is we kind of give them the option. So we'll give them the option of what type of drink they might want. So is it a fully carbohydrate drink or is it just an electrolyte drink? Again, we'll try and give condensed versions so they don't take too much on. Um, but then we'll also ask them what other form of carbohydrate that might be. It might be some jelly babies. It might be a carbohydrate gel want some of the aspirate pots of honey. Uh, thankfully that game didn't go to extra time so we didn't have to have any poor impression on the pitch. But we'll have that and then as soon as the it's going to extra time, the uh, sports science sports staff will come and give that to the player. Again, it's more just to make sure they get something on. Um, obviously when we're going to 120 minutes, the risk of dehydration is, is a bit more pronounced. So it's just trying to to keep an eye, I guess, on the players and just promote that at the break within the half time as well, just that they're taking on some form of hydration. But predominantly, the main thing for me would be to push the intake of carbohydrates. Thanks. So, yeah, Julia, and Rob's obviously touched upon the nutrition side, but what about also like the nutrition for maybe like the cognition as, as uh, games go into extra time or even penalties? If you could comment on that. Yeah, um, as Rob sort of mentioned, it is just trying to promote that carbohydrate intake. It's going to be um, that, that really that's the fuel for the brain. Um, it's obviously dehydration also affects cognition as well. So just encouraging them to get that food, um, that carbs on board and having those options there um, so that they can choose what they want because then they're most likely to have it if it's in a form that they actually want to take it in. Thanks. And then more specific to nutrition, Julia, what was your nutrition recommendations for someone that might be following a plant-based diet or if you've got time to also comment on maybe like a high-fat keto diet? Yeah, um, so with the plant-based diets, they're probably going to be meeting their carbohydrate requirements. Um, I suppose that, that's one side of, of eating more plant-based. You're eating a lot more, more grains. Um, so it's probably more protein intake that they might need to have to be considerate of um, and making sure that they're getting their protein sources from a wide variety of plant foods because they don't always have to make, to make sure that you're getting all the amino acids, um, the essential amino acids. Um, and then with the keto more high fat diet I think the athletes themselves might notice that they might feel a bit sluggish or they might not be able to just kick on or accelerate as as much so it's just working with them and maybe getting them to try all right you've tried the keto diet a few a few times in training how's it making you feel maybe incorporate some carbohydrate um, and maybe just working with the athletes getting them to buy in and and encouraging them to see if they can notice a difference within their own performance um, and their own mood um, as well. Yeah, because from a research perspective, obviously there's been some research looking at high fat diet and performance in endurance athletes. But from my understanding of what I know, there's not anything in team sport athletes yet, is there? Not them I'm aware of, um, but even with their endurance-based research, they're still working at a high percentage of, of their VO2 max. You know, um, it's about 80 percent, 80%, um, 
and so they they aren't using some of that carbohydrate still in order to to get that performance advantage so I think that will translate so might, to the team sports. Yeah, could translate over. That's a really good point. Um, Rob, um, a question for you. Have you got any recommendations as to how we can avoid um, overhydration or hypohydration? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I guess a good measure typically to go by is drinking to first and not just thinking if there is a break in play or is it, if it is at half time, just that I have to get um any kind of fluids on so drink it first is a pretty good measure for most people that would be it might still need a little bit of work with nutritionists to work on that we've as i mentioned before we've evolved to kind of be able to cope with a certain level of dehydration um and the the idea of trying to just push it before first for me i don't i just don't think it's necessary particularly within football so i just encourage them probably not to have a huge amount of water and Kind of a little bit linked to the point Huli just made. I think a lot of the time that you'll feel, you'll know you've drank too much, you'll feel it in your stomach uh, when you try and start running the round. So probably trying to take a few mouthfuls, listen to whatever the coach is saying, talking amongst uh, your, your colleagues and your players. Um, I think that's it really. I don't, feel, I don't know if more scientific than just, just going to first and, and not just chipping down a, a full bottle of water. Do you, do you, with like your experience of working um, with a club, um, and I don't know whether you measure players' sweat rates, um, but have you ever tried to do like personalised fluid recommendations if you do know a player's sweat rate? Is it feasible? Does it work in an applied setting? We, I've, I've not personally got, had any experience with it, just from a, the kind of. From, from the research that I've seen, I've not seen a huge amount for the individualization of that currently. And also just from a time perspective, to try and get for a full squad of players would be pretty difficult. There was one player who had particular issues with ever drinking anything, and that's because he really struggled with anything cold. So it'd have to be like room temperature drinks and things like that. We came up with a bit of a rough plan for, for that individual. It was mainly aimed at trying to increase the carbohydrate intake than as opposed to solely fluid. But we didn't have any data to go from from his sweat rates, and um, so it's just kind of a very general try and take this on these periods of play. He was a winger actually, so we used to leave it at the side of the pitch for him as well. So then he'd just try and take on different points. But as a, again, as I've mentioned before, it's it's not we wasn't necessarily as a huge amount of the hydration. It was because that was his kind of choice of carbohydrates. He didn't like gels, didn't like to have jelly babies or anything to eat or anything. So by him restricting his fluid, he was also restricting his carbohydrate intake as well. Yeah, and I guess like we are talking football here, and as you've both mentioned, like the opportunity to take on board fluid and nutrition is extremely limited. So it's kind of use trying to get on in the right moments or whenever whenever you can. And um, we have had a previous webinar on carbohydrate mouth rinse. Um, Julia, I wondered whether you could comment on whether you think that's could be a good strategy for football? Um, I think just because the duration of a football match, uh, you probably need to actually ingest the carbohydrate, I think, to get more of the benefits uh, from it. I think the mouth rinse is really useful maybe for some shorter duration um, activities. And if you think, you know, you take into account the warm up as well as the match, and then potentially they might be going into extra time as well. Um, I think they really need to actually take the fuel on on board. So the mouth rinse might help with the sensation, um, but I think they'll notice it more towards particularly the back end of a game if they actually haven't digested um, and absorbed the carbohydrate. Yeah, Robin, I think to add on, on that one. Yeah, I'd, I'd completely agree with what Julia said. I guess for us, we've used mouth rinse as like a last result. So when players really struggle to take things on, such as that individual, you do a mouth rinse. I think it's something you see players do a lot. So you know, you'll yeah. see players go and grab a bottle, take it, and then they'll mm -hmm. spit a lot of it out. As a nutritionist, you're like, please just drink it. But um, <laughs> it, it might be useful when they're struggling to take things on, such as maybe when it's in the game itself. I mean, not to relate it back to my own personal stuff, but I played a game of football last night and I really struggled to get anything on. So a mouth rinse sometimes might work for me. And if you're in hot environments, I think sometimes people struggle with the stomach. Uh, a little bit so yeah, I'd agree with Julio try to get the fuel on if you can but if last result a, a mouth rinse it, it, it is not the worst option. 
Um, and then obviously like with your applied experience, do, do you do any of the, the carbohydrate personalization throughout the season, considering like differences in pre-season compared to when it's during season? Um, it, not, not for the team I'm currently with, because we would typically play you nearly know, three games every week for the full season. Um, so it's pretty full on from domestic and European competition. They have a little because they have in the Scottish League they have a break at Christmas, so it's at least a bit more of a, a packed schedule of other points. So to be honest, my biggest issue with most of the time is are they eating enough carbohydrates? Which, as any nutritionist will tell you, that, that's a great position to be in. It's uh, it's when then you're dealing with maybe players who are not as in as involved with the squad, where you try and structure it probably a little bit more. Um, so try and get that with those some plans, but just from the sheer volume of games in football, I think a lot of the time it's those instances are few and far between because the off squad rotation, etc. So I don't use a huge amount of carbohydrate periodization, but I find similar to what we found in the data in the paper with Liam Anderson, footballs are kind of regulate this themselves a little bit again, just through making the correct choices. So what we'll try and do is maybe if we are in a period of not as many games or lower intensity training, the options that will be available in the canteen at breakfast and lunch, they might change. So it's not as pushing when we're looking for that carbohydrate load. You, you know, you can't walk two steps without carbohydrate being shoved in your face. Whereas on other days, we'll take that away. And we find that kind of regulates it a bit, bit easier than giving people an individual number plan kind of thing. Yeah, so you can kind of guide it depending on where you, what food you place in the yes. canteen at the right different stages. Um, one thing yeah. that I've noticed on like both of your like your history or your your career so far is that you've worked with both youth and senior athletes. Um, maybe if I could ask both of you, I'll go to you first, Julia. What what education or what one thing would you always implement at an academy stage to set them up for success in their senior career? Um, if I have access to a kitchen, I think like practical workshops are a fantastic um, way to just try and develop some cooking skills and you can always make it a competition because then that gets them really engaged because um, they always want to win um, and beat their teammates. Mm -hmm. So, and then and include some nutrition education elements, getting them to explain why, you know, why are we having rice with this meal or how else can you use it um, to for recovery? Um, as well and get them um, that way I think that's definitely really really valuable um, and if not just trying to don't have access to a kitchen then getting in mentors or um, senior players that they look up to hopefully come in and, and talk about their nutrition experience as well because they'll often you know probably take on board something that someone they idolize is saying compared to what I'm trying to say um, as well. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. Robin, I think that you would say to Academy? Uh, no, pretty much the uh, same, any kind of competition. We did a supermarket sweep thing one time and it was going down an absolute storm. Um, I think uh, one thing that I probably didn't do enough when I first was uh, at the Academy uh, was actually telling them the why as well. So not just being too mm -hmm. dictatory, you know, like, you know, have these type of foods that actually trust the, the young athlete to, of, of why they're doing it, but also getting the parents involved as well, because ultimately for a lot of these athletes oh, who are under 17, 18, they're not buying the foods. They're probably not cooking the food that often. Um, so trying to get a parent buy-in as well would be similar things as, as Julia mentioned. Yeah, that's a great point because you can do all you can do with these players, but then when they go home to their parents, they're going to eat what their parents put on the table. So yeah educating the parents as well that sounds like a, a great idea and um, we're actually at the hour i feel like we could continue but that's all we've got time for today so i just want to say thank you so much to both of you for um presenting um it's a really enjoyable hour um and we had a great discussion i'd also like to thank all of the um, attendees for turning up today um, and just a reminder that if you've attended three or more webinars and we will be sending out a certificate to people that have attended. Um, we do have two more webinars coming up, so if this is your first one, please join us for the following two to ensure that you do get your certificate. Um, so again, thank you so much, Julia, and thanks, Rob, um, for a great session. And 
Um, our next webinar will be held on the 29th of September. So we've got a three week gap until the next one and we'll be focusing on basketball where we'll be taking the, the theory into practice um, for nutrition and also for coaching. So please join us then on the 29th. Um, so thanks again, guys, and uh, we'll be back on the 29th of September. Thanks, Becca. Thanks, Becca.